Peter, what's happening? What's going on? How Thanks. are you, bro? Yeah, good, good. How you doing? Good, good. Thanks so much for coming in, bro. It's been a while. Yeah, I think we've been trying to sort this out. Like, yeah. Since the end of last year. How hard out of 10? Like, out of everyone, when you, you know, we're at the Olympic Games, you've, you've done us proud. How hard was I jumping on the bandwagon out of 10? <laughs> like, compared to everyone else, was it, did, was I the standout? Or was uh, it, uh, you, was took the, you took the number one. Oh, really? For real. I was the worst. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, I loved it. Okay. I've always wanted to come on the show. Good. So. Oh, good. But I'm, good. I was like, why didn't you want to have me before the Olympics? Well, yeah, yeah, no, I, I did. I did. But, um, you know, I'm a big fan of athletics. So I yeah. keep up with the calendar a lot. And yeah. I've been watching. I was watching prior. Um, been, on the, been on the bandwagon from the start. But I was like, I'm just going to let him do his thing. I knew he would come to fruition. So blessed to have you in, bro. Thanks so much. Exciting times. I thought you were living in Perth. We've been back and forth because you've been all over the joint. Yeah. And then I find out you live like 20 metres from here. Yeah, I think, I think that's probably number one. We need to kind of clear that up. Yeah. Um, I actually do live in Melbourne. I've been yeah. living in Melbourne for like six years. Yeah. And, but I only spent about six months in Melbourne. And funny enough, it only took me about a minute to walk to here. So I'm just up in Richmond. Hey, so good. yeah, I live here. And most of, like about three months overseas, obviously, because summer sport and opposite seasons to Europe. So we spend about from May until about September, January, I'm out of Melbourne, which is, yeah, like global citizen, really. That's crazy. How hard is it to have like a... You, you, like you think of most sports, like team sports, I suppose, and what I'm used to, you got like a season, right? So you got like the start, the end, but with like at athletics, track and field and like what you're doing, mm. it's you, it's sort of like just meets and like you don't really have that. Well, do you have a downtime or is it just like getting a break in between? Yeah, because Australia has its season. So by the time I finish my European season, the Australian season is starting. But the good thing is we don't really focus too hard on the Australian season. Yeah. We'd come out, like the Australian season starts in what, sep end of September? but I won't come out and race properly into like nationals really, which is April yeah. when the season's about to finish and then European season. Cause that's more important, European season. That's when the world championships are all around August. So we try just to pick where you are trying to peak. So if it was like, I guess the Gold Coast 2018, you'd want it to peak in Australia, which is, um, which is a lot easier because you're from Australia. So you're used to it. So when you're training, right? Like say you're at the moment, you're probably in your not peak season but like yeah. you're coming back like australian season starting do you have like guys and and girls that are you're racing with that are like trying to knock you off but you're like not even really trying this time <laughs> of year? is that how it works because you're, oh. you're sort of like working towards something that's next building yeah so the best the best way to put it is we try like i guess purposely be in our i guess b shape while we're in australia mm. and then we try to be in like our a game while we're in europe and um most of the times i think being in your b-shape you can get away in australia at the moment uh it depends on the event like mm. you've, you've seen i guess the olympics you've seen the 1500 like those boys are competitive because you know with sports so unique that only three people can make a team mm. um so and you have like a an event like the 1500 where they have like five people that are able to qualify they need to be in, a, in the a standards during nationals but whilst the 800 i think we only get about three people hit the standard which is 145.20 so you can kind of get away with not being as, as fit here and yeah. then kind of focus all your energy in the European season. And thinking of that as well, like even just jumping ahead, but like the people that you train with in Australia, like your closest teammates, say those ones that are, uh, are with you and they're training to go to that Europe season, you want to make sure that they're, obviously you're competitors, but like you nearly need them to be going as well as well. So it like pushes you. It's like that, you know, yeah. like what is it? You sort of like the, what is it? The rising tide sinks the boat. That's not the quote, yeah. but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. I guess a great, a great yeah, example. Yeah, rising tide sinks the boat. That's definitely <laughs> it. That's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a great example of that, I think, with my training partner and my housemate, Joseph Deng, who actually held the previous Australian record over the 800 metres. And like I said before, you have three people in a team. So if Joseph and I are both trying to, make the 800 team yeah. that only leaves literally one spot for the rest of Australia to make that team. And it's like, well, we just kind of figured out, like if we work together and we're both in our A team, then we can have two spots. So like we worry about the last spot for someone else. Mm. Um, but yeah, it works out anyways, you know, cause you're kind of at your best. So if, even if you don't make it, you know, your teammate is in shape to kind of go there and be competitive against the world mm. rather if we didn't work together and, we kind of all running average and going there, getting knocked out in the heats or, or the semifinals when the goal is to be the finals and hopefully win. Of course. Because I was thinking about it earlier when I was like thinking of that analogy that was totally fucking didn't even make sense. But I was putting it into my context and I was thinking like, you know, any young kid that goes in the draft, right? And they get try to get drafted to an AFL club. Initially, 
Um, they might think like going to a, a lower club that isn't performing that well. They go, fuck you, I'm going to go here. I'm going to play all these early season, like early games in the year. Yeah. Um, but long term, they don't have maybe the structure around them to like make them the best player they are. Mm-hmm. Whereas you look at like the gun teams, like the Hawthorns of the last 10 years, they have all these kids that go and they're getting like pushed and supported by all these senior players. They might not play early. They do these massive apprenticeships, but because they're playing with so many good players, it just makes them better and like makes them compete and it gives them a lot of experience too i guess mm. in that sense like um from, i came into the sport so late when i was 17 so that's about like almost 11 years ago and um you know you just like you said footy you go up with juniors and play up so athletics you know you got um nationals you've got world juniors and commonwealth games all these stepping steps to the olympics but I think what was unique about my story is I didn't have any other experiences. So my first Australian team was literally the Olympic Games. So then you go up there and you kind of choke. Like it would have helped having so your first Australian team that. was yeah. the Olympic team. And that was really Rio. Yeah. Like it's just like, wow, what am I doing here? Kind of thing. It's like you just wow. it's kind of just nervous and stuff like that. And you would have preferred to have those experiences a lot earlier, like world juniors and whatnot. Yeah. But I started pretty late. But at the same time, it's not a bad place to start. Take us back to, you know, your childhood. Um, when you got to Australia, how you got into athletics. I know you were playing a bit of basketball. You had a scholarship. Mm. Um, you transitioned into athletics. That might sort of set up a story into how you, you were a late bloomer into the sport. Yeah, that's, um, that's a good one. Um, so I was... Thank you. I was, <laughs> I was, I was, born, I was born in Sudan. Um, my parents, both Sudanese. My mum is from the north side. My dad's from the south side. Um, and I was born in the north side. So the closest place while everyone was kind of leaving Sudan during the conflicts and, and all the issues that were happening. If you're South Sudanese, where my dad was from, you kind of went the Kenyan route. And if you're North Sudanese, you went through um, Egypt, which is the closest. So I went to Egypt and I was there for about four years with my family and then moved to Australia at the age of 10. And I was in like Toowoomba, Queensland. So it was like completely different. Different landscapes. Different landscapes, different, um, different I guess, life. And then like different language to start yeah. off with. Do you speak, so, did you speak English at all? No, I didn't speak a word of English. But I guess when you're 10 years old, you pick languages up pretty fast. Yeah. And um, when you go into school and that's the only language spoken, you have no choice than to learn pretty fast. So yeah. Uh, and then from there, I'll spend about four years there and then my family relocated to Perth. So that's where I went to school. And I was on a basketball scholarship at St. Norbert's College. And I always say that I'm a great basketball player because I was on a scholarship. Um, that's like my story, but, <laughs> but really I think, I think I was kind of just good enough to keep that scholarship. And I think I was even the tallest in the team, which is, so I played every position and I was fun. And I remember like we had to do athletics because athletics compulsory, like for a kid coming from, from Egypt, from Sudan, whatever it's like, no one wants to run. Like athletics is not, it's not compulsory. It's like this thing you kind of did, it was like boring. Like I didn't want to do it. And it took me like two years or something to be convinced. And the story goes, we had a school carnival and I, and I came first in school. And then we went into school and went university in all different schools from Western Australia. And I came second. And my teacher kind of comes and taps me on the shoulder and says, I think you're really talented and you need to do this out of school. And I was like, no, who like, I don't want to run. That's not fun. I kind of prefer to play basketball. And it took like two years to really, to really, um, listen to that advice. And the only reason I listened to it is because I kept coming second to this, to this kid. He just keeps beating me. I don't know what school he went to. And I kind of went and knocked on her door and I said, like, why does this kid keep beating me? And she, she kind of whispered, she's like, you know, like he does something called training. And I'm like, no way. He's <laughs> like, um, yeah, sign me up. And from there on, like, I never looked back. Yeah, good. Do you know, <laughs> do you know where he is now? Um, that, uh, I have no idea actually. <laughs> oh, you, you ruined it. You ruined it for him. You crushed his dream. Now you're at the Olympics. Yeah, that's fair. Okay. Um, let's go back quickly just to when you're saying uh, you, you came to Australia because there, there was, when we were doing the research for the show, there was like a false article that came out about yeah. you and your family that was worked, like you cleared it up eventually, but it was sort of maybe creating a narrative that wasn't there. And you've always yeah. been really strong on, on, you know, being truthful with your pathway here and, and how it all transpired. Yeah. Um, do you, can you tell us about that? Yeah, that's, I guess that's important what you just said. It, I think I wasn't irritated that the story was like, um, from refugee camp to the Olympics. I wasn't, it was more like the assumptions, like for, for you to find out where I'm from or, or like we're having this conversation. It's just, it's just as easy as having that conversation. Yeah. Like if someone, like all these stories were like leading to the same thing and 
it's like like how hard is it to just sit down and say um, or pick up a phone and like say where, where do you come from like you can just clear that up so no one kind of bothered to clear that up and i think it's the assumption that kind of was like nah i think it's more powerful if we tell a story mm. in our own way so it's it's a good platform to clear that up but no i never i never lived in a refugee camp um uh it was it's not part of my story so it's the fact that wasn't true but i did come to australia as a refugee but just never lived in a refugee camp but it also doesn't mean like there wasn't i think there was that story that they're trying to sell like the struggle the struggle like doesn't mean there wasn't struggle out there at the same time like of course it was struggle because we had to leave where we lived to go to a different country and try to come to australia it's just it wasn't the way it was told and i think it was just important to tell it yeah definitely well it's your it's your story mm. and you don't want people to tell it without your your authority so yeah yeah it's good to clear up and and thank you for um yeah talking about it today because i know it is it is something that um you know it is your story so yeah let's keep telling it in wa doing some athletics you start to take some uh take things seriously yeah so how old are you at this time like when are you thinking like fuck like this is um you know i'm actually training now i'm starting to win yeah was it ever then thinking like all right i want to make the olympics or was it something you're like i'm just going to do this to to get by was it just a hobby like what was the no i always i always had pretty high goals because you know i've got a pretty big family and within that family i've got four brothers and everything's like super competitive mm-hmm. like going back when i said it was easy to learn english i guess because we're competing to see who can speak english like the fastest so it was like you know everything was a competition and it's like if you weren't first then it was like it kind of wasn't good enough you the uh, oldest or bro- youngest no or? i was right in the middle in the middle so i had to kind of compete against the two top and try to be above the two at the bottom and um so yeah it was just it's just that i guess that was huge motivation to kind of just try to be the best be the best and it started that like i mean you entertain this idea of being the fastest in the school and as a kid at school like you're like wow like i'm the fastest in the school and then you're like the fastest at everyone in school and you tick that box off it's like man imagine being the fastest in the state mm. and then you go do um i guess state champs and you it took me about three three to f- six months to become the fastest in the whole western Australian state in my age group that year and then i started entertaining that idea of like man i imagine being the fastest in the whole australia like as a junior and then of course it doesn't all go smooth and i went to my first nationals and yeah i got disqualified and it didn't work out and i think i was so disappointed that year that the following year i didn't actually go back to nationals and 2013 my final year as a junior it was actually in perth and nothing nothing happens in perth because so far all eastern states don't want to kind of go to perth for nationals well you, they don't let us in either so it's sort of hard <laughs> well, well back then you guys are allowed in it makes it hard to sort of get there at the moment yeah back then when the borders are open yeah yeah so i was like man it would be nice to win nationals and be the fastest right in front of home crowd like your family your friends and everything and and i think it was it's quite funny actually because i was you know i'm quite laid back and i remember my coach was like yeah i think you can do it i was running about if you guys know 800 times so i was running about 154 mm-hmm. and he said i think you need about a 150 to place top three which four seconds by the way is like that's it's probably a, one thing i want to talk about just while, while we're there is mm. people listening to this who might not know a lot about running four seconds is a lot is a lot a lot it? like it's nearly 40 meters would you say yeah like, it's a lot and it takes sometimes years sometimes just the training for it is ridiculous yeah. so but i was like man i think we can do it right because i'm i was just that confident and i didn't know how hard it was and uh, but i was also quite laid back and i was finishing school and i remember i sat my coach down and said yes this is the plan and i said uh, yep let's do it i think we can come top three at nationals uh, but before we do that i need like a good week off and he's like are you serious like what do you need a week for i was like man we gotta go to schoolies right oh. <laughs> where'd you go and he got he got he got so mad and frustrated <laughs> and but i was like no i promise like as soon as i come back like it's go time and he gave me like i think he gave me he said he didn't give me the whole week he said you got five days yeah and i went to school for five days and and i came back just as promised and because you finish school and you got like three months until you start uni or whatever and i was like man let's just train and i remember the first thing i did was like chuck my sim card away it's like i'm just gonna train like not really contact anyone and just kind of focus on trying to get this goal done and i think i just gave my phone number to my parents and my siblings and we just kind of got to work and by the time nationals came around the corner i actually won it in like 148 and i became the fastest and i was like damn like like what's next you know and next of course is like being the fastest in australia like senior age and that's when you make proper teams 
um, because before that I was missing like World well, Juniors, missing out everything. And yeah, and then from there I was like, well, how do I get to the next step? And I said, I think it would be a good idea to move to, to Melbourne, to the east side, because that's where all the runners were. And it just makes it easier to just running the weather and everything. And, and the Olympics was coming up and I was like, I mean, as arrogant as it sounds, it was like, it would be great to debut an Australian team at the Olympic Games. So I moved here for that. I love what you said then, like, as arrogant as it sounds, it's not arrogant. But, like, in your head, right, like, mm. how much, especially in individual sports, do you have to, like, just tell yourself you're the best? Yeah, you kind of have to. Like, a good perspective is, you're st- it's like Tokyo, you're standing at a start line in the heats and you're up against seven other people. And, okay, the, the 800, only 48 people in the world can run it. And by the final, it drops down to eight. So you're standing there. And I guarantee you, like, all those eight people or seven people in your heat are thinking they're going to get the top three positions. But they can only be one. So like there's no there's no room for like negative thinking. There's no room for like mm. issues or like thinking about niggles and thinking about that. Like the only the only thing that's in your head is like, well, let's just focus on on the job and let's get it done. Yeah. At all cost. Fuck. So many questions. Okay. So firstly, you talk about before um, you know, you move into Melbourne, you're getting like better you start thinking fuck this is actually a reality okay mm. and we saw, we spoke about just before like how when you say four seconds how far along that actually is like that's a long time yeah and i was speaking, I was speaking to sam before we we're talking about um marginal gains and yeah. like when you know you are an athlete and you're like you're training and when you're at that level like it's diminishing returns you can only get so much better mm-hmm. like the, and the it has to be so small to do it yeah to get to the olympics how many like marginal gains did you have to find and alluding to the fact that again giving more context there's this video that we used to watch when i was um at carlton didn't necessarily work for them but it (laughs) might have worked for you was talking about like this english um cycling team in in the olympics and they spoke about that you know they just kept coming second and third or you know not placing whatever it was and instead of trying to get like a 30 percent better or 10 percent better they're like if we can get better in one percent of everything we do then you find your 10%, which is massive when it comes to it. So it's like, you know, they took their mattresses and slept on their own mattresses in hotels instead of other bits so they get better sleep. They greased their chains up twice as much as any other team. They made sure their wheel alignment was all better. Um, basically, like what what a part of those trainings did you implement into yours to get to the Olympics? I guess the first thing has got to be like like self-awareness and it's, it's like knowing that the moment you're satisfied, the moment like progress starts kind of becoming slow and you kind of don't even want to look for those one percent and like i say that because like it depends how you define success and progress like yes i was i was making teams which is what i always wanted to do and then i was making teams and i was getting knocked out in the heats and the semis it's like then you got to kind of go back and like what's your goal and, and like intention set the goal like i don't want to focus on making teams anymore like that should almost be automatic yeah. and again sounds arrogant but if you're spending all your energy trying to make teams you don't have, really have room to think about by the time you get there, like you're unexhausted. So you're sort of capping yourself. Like, mm. yeah, you like just you thinking, like, get the bare minimum. Get the bare, yeah, exactly. So, and that's why we say like, you sh- I should be able now to make teams off my, off my B shape. Cause I mean, to be, to go to the Olympics and just run the standard, you're sometimes there just as a passenger. Cause people usually run a lot faster than that standard. So if you want to make the final, then you got to kind of look for those, I guess, one percenters and, and we had to kind of do a lot. And it started off, I guess, when I first, you know, there's a few funny stories. When I first started running um, and I made my first Olympic team, like the only way I got to the Olympics was like training hard and just being consistent. Like I didn't know about sports nutrition. I didn't know about sports psychology. I didn't know about, about anything. In fact, I was in America, just at a holding camp. And I remember someone wanted to speak to me, part of the Australian team. I was like to my coach, like, why does this guy want to speak to me? Like, I don't really, I don't want to speak to him, right? And my coach's like, no, nah, that's a sports psychologist. I'm like, sports psychologist? Like, like you got to remember where I come from. Like, that's like, like what we need sports psychologists for. Like, of course I need sports psychology this thing, but I was like, do I really believe in it? Do I like just train hard and get there and, and everything will kind of take care of itself. Uh, and I said, nah. And then finally I was like, I'll speak to this guy. And, and we went, I went and sat down and spoke to him, it's a psychologist and he put his hand up, he's like, picture this bubble. And in my head, I'm like, this guy wants to speak about bubbles and we're going to the Olympics in a week. That's, that's ridiculous, right? 
anyway, he's like, picture this bubble and this bubble represents your energy. And he held his hand up like that. And it's like, well, the, you don't want to be too inside in the middle, which means you'd be nervous and, and whatnot, right? And spending time in your room, thinking about the race, thinking about the race. Again, by the time you get to the race, you're exhausted mentally and you can't perform, which is what happened in Rio. And you don't want to be too outside of it, which is, I think, what I was at risk at. And being too outside of it means being too distracted. And like the Olympic Games, like you're, you're kind of an adult, you make your own choices and, and you get excited about a lot of things. I remember, I think one of the first stories I remember is I chucked my bag up and I was playing, playing table tennis for like ages. I don't even know why. And mm. just because it was there and I looked up and like, I could see like Clay Thompson standing right there. And I was like, damn, like, like basketball still to this day is my favorite sport. I was like, damn, that's, that's Clay Thompson. And Luda, I know, I didn't even know who I was running against. I didn't know the runners yet. And also there's that, you know, I don't tend to get too excited about food, but at the Olympic Games, like food's free. Oh, the buffet. The buffet. I used to call that the stuff. The, the, the vending machines. Yeah. Like there's McDonald's for free. Um, really? Yeah. Like I got three haircuts and my hair's not that long. <laughs> like, I mean, every, everything's just free. And then you're getting yeah. out of, and then you get out of this bubble and like, man, that guy was like, he's speaking facts. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you get out, then you realize all of that stuff. And then, and then I guess going back to that, small 1% is, is getting in the right head game. Cause in perspective, I'd rather be um, in the right mindset over being too fit. Cause really? yeah, you can okay. be like extremely fit and still underperform. But if you can't then the right mindset, you like there's muscle memory, you know, sometimes you get injured and some people come back and they're like, whoa, like how did I do that? Like muscle memory, right? But if you're in the right mindset and you're thinking positively, like sometimes things can happen. But I guess the ultimate goal is, to kind of align them both like physically and mentally like be be in shape and it requires a lot of training so again going back to one percent it requires like doing a little bit extra so it's not just about going to the gym and doing the gym work it's about going to the gym and doing it with intent like what am i getting out of it what am i here for and like what's the purpose of it and then you start believing all these things and once you start believing things like the, all these beautiful things kind of happen um another one was like i guess we started doing pilates in 2020 and that helped a lot um pool running for example you know because you can train as much as you want in the pool you can't run forever because you know you might start getting injured stress fractures and loading but like in the pool and cross training you can kind of load up in your body as well so those are those small one percentage as well and another one is experience you have to get the experience like you gotta go race against the best in the world to kind of know um what's going to be like yeah, and I suppose what you're saying before about going to Rio and not getting out what you wanted to made you then learn all those things mm. the next time you went there. When you said um, about the Olympics just before, and you said you'd rather be, you know, better prepared mentally than, um, you know, than more important than the physical aspect. Yeah. How um, how important is that more in like your style of race too? So like the 800, it's not like a 100 meter sprint, right? There's not a lot of tactics in a 100 meter sprint. It's a, you know, you, just you get out there and you go. <laughs> yeah. But with the 800, I'm assuming of, in your style of races, like with the leader, you know, you can either go out and, you know, really test a field or you can sit back and then there's a sprint at the end. Yeah. So like the mental side of that run is probably more than any other run. Yeah. Like in the Olympics, would that be fair to say? Or Yeah. It's, although it's sometimes time. I think that's why the hundreds probably get the most respect because yeah, they're literally running for nine to 10 seconds. Like I couldn't imagine like at the start line, like there is no room for error. Mm. Like absolutely none. So that's why I guess it's so respected. Although you got to kind of go hard, um, you still see them like running so relaxed. So I guess there's a little bit of that tactical part of it. But in the 800, there's, there's that, there's room for error, but also when you're at the top, there's really no room for error. And I always say the best races I've ever had is a race that I, I did not think about anything. You're just in the present. Like there's a move that you have to make. You didn't think about making it because the moments I thought about making that move, it's like cut in or, or like go in front of this guy, someone's already done it. Mm. And it happened to me once in Paris and I'm like sitting, sitting. I was like, nah, I need to go. And by the time I tried to go, someone's already cut you off. You gotta just be automatic. Like so your body's sort of, gotta yeah, be so automatic. It'd be sort of hard. like, do you go into a race with a plan then? Or do you just, you run and you see what the field's doing and then you make decisions? You go, you go, I go every race with a plan, but not to depend on it. Yeah. Cause it could, your plan could be off the mark from, I guess from the first hundred meters, especially the crossover. So if your plan is to kind of be top three and someone like everyone's going out too hard, then you don't want to race just for 200, burn out, you burn yeah. yourself out. So you got to actually have that race plan, but also just learn to race in the moment at the same time. 
Talk us through like in, in an 800 because like we'll get to like your heats and stuff um, and the final in of the Olympics shortly. But ideally with an 800, like a lot of us and, and me included would have no idea what's ideal for that. Is it getting, is it drawing lane one? Is it leading the race? Is it sitting like third and trying to win? I know you're saying there's different techniques, but ideally for you personally, what would be like the dream situation in an 800? I, I actually think the best position is probably number being second to fourth. Because then you're not the front, but you're there with the kick. Because again, you're versing the best in the world. You don't want to give him too much of a head start. Like, there's no chance you're going to catch him. It's just hard. So for me, ideally, and you saw in the heats and the semis, I was sitting top three, both of them. I guess through the, the whole Olympics, because I was just like, man, when it's time to go in that 100, I want to be, I want to be there. But you have, I guess other people have different styles. You have some Europeans that sit all the way at the back. But if you're going to sit at the back and the race is fast, it helps. But if the race is low, then it's pretty hard because everyone has that kick at the end and no one's kind of burnt out the energy at the start. So really for me, I think being like dead in the middle, top three, I like that. Um, but also I'm not trying to expose myself to, for nationals coming yeah, 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 for yeah, all yeah, these yeah, listeners, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, we're joking. We're joking. <laughs> we're joking. Yeah, we're joking. Um, no, listen. no, that's why you kind of got to change it up. Yeah. You, you can't yeah. be pre- too predictable. Like, yeah. um, like you got to know your opponents too. Like at the Olympics, you knew who the front runners were. If you had them in your heat, you're like, yep, that's going to be a fast race. Yeah. It's like, we might spend a lot of energy, but it gives you a chance to be the fastest loser. Talk us through um, the Olympic campaign. So obviously COVID threw things into the into the works. Like I can imagine when that was about to kick off, there was debate whether it goes ahead and whatnot. This is before it got delayed. Mm. So how did that happen with your training then? Because I imagine so many athletes would have been, you know, like peaking at that stage. Um, and then it gets delayed and you go, fuck, like, mm. I've, what are we doing? And gets yeah. delayed back. Was that the case? Or do you think maybe in a way it actually served you better having it delayed back? It definitely served me better because I didn't anticipate like how hard you needed to work to be the top of the world. And like, I would have definitely been in Tokyo probably 2020, but not in the final. Mm. Like, you know, I ran 144 like once or whatever in 2020 in 2021 i run it a bunch of times you need to be able to run a bunch of times not just once in 2020 i would have been there but it would have been a completely different story so it definitely served me better and i guess how i dealt with it is i was quite chilled actually like when (laughs) when the olympics like things started getting postponed and getting cancelled like not to say that i wasn't kind of hit by it because i guess different stages different people like if it's the end of your career you'd be devastated um if you were planning to get married or have kids or whatever like you'd be devastated but for me i was i was okay like with another year um and in fact i thought i needed it but i was quite chilled like the moment i found out the olympics was postponed i woke up i think in the morning i don't know he sent me the message or i saw it i booked a flight to perth and i went back to sleep woke up caught that flight and spent the rest of time at home with family so that was that was pretty cool because like in a normal year I wouldn't have been able to spend that much time in Perth yeah. with family. So I just went straight back home and kind of, I think we took about a week, week off just to think about it. And, and then I think my coach said like, you guys still want to go to Europe? My coach, Justin and agent James said, you can still go to Europe and compete. And we said, yeah, cause then you needed something. It's like, okay, motivation's back again. Like we're training for the European season. Takes back to the prep then, okay, yeah. of, the, of the Olympics. Um, how are you feeling? Obviously we know the result, but like, going into that and I bring out okay pretend like no one's listening to this I want to hear that like arrogant self in your head talk yeah. me through like were you going and going I can fucking win this or were you going and going alright it's going to be cool let's see what happens like what was what was really going through your head like you said your prep was better because you had that extra time you're going in you make the final you come forth you know you're leading the race yeah. as you said how were you tracking going into it I think what's important is I let the moment I was leaving Australia us and preparing for the games while still in Australia, I said, I am not going to the Olympic Games to be a passenger. I've been there as a passenger the previous year, um, which is okay because I was getting the experience in the world championships like that. I was like, if I'm only running 145 or struggling to run the standards, I actually don't want to go. Like, it's deeper than that now. Like, I don't just want to go there for the experience and whatnot. I've had those. I want to actually go there, be competitive. So it was that arrogance at the start. Like, no, nah, like, I'm, I'm not going, even if you make a team, like, I want to make a team and make sure I'm competitive enough to be the best in the world. And and there was a video um, I did in, in the Gold Coast and 
uh, before the games and I said, I oh, like, I believe I'm going to make the final. Like, I wasn't going there just hoping I'm going to make the final. I actually believed I was going to make it. And to believe you're going to make the final out of the 48 people in the world where I guess I was ranked like 20 something in the world. It's, it's a pretty big call for a lot of people, but you got to know in yourself, that's, that's what you believe. And I believed it because I was just training. I was training like that. I remember I finished one session and I was thinking to myself, there is no way there's more than 10 people faster than me in this world, mm. like race wise. Like there's just no way. Yeah. I'm in, I'm in crazy shape mentally and physically. And there is no way like, and that's why I guess we changed our original plan from going straight from Australia to um, Tokyo. We're like, now let's go to Europe and prove that and gain a little bit more confidence. And just last minute, we changed our plan to go to Europe. So on the, that plan, of cha- that change of plan, that obviously gave you the confidence because you're racing, like you're, in, you're feeling in good nick. Yeah. On like time and on like reputation in, in the 400 worldwide, would was it a big call for like you know because i'm not in the four walls of the 400 uh, the 800 community sorry was it a big call if someone said you know peter's going to make the final was it something that like was obvious or was it still something that it was like that's 50 50. no it was not obvious at all in fact there was no write-ups about the 800 there was nothing about that like it was yeah it was almost like you know like what are you thinking yeah and 800 is a tough event so no it was i think the only people that Weren't surprised, I guess, your training mates, um, my coach Justin and my agent, James Templeton. Cause like he's seen the way, although I wasn't running as fast times as the rest of the world were running, like the way I was running races and winning races, um, just by myself in Australia, he just showed how strong you were. And it's like, it's like, yeah, you could, physically you can make it, like the mental part is up to you now. So it's just like all kind of left to you. And yeah, I was just like, no, nah, there's no way like, I think I've got, I've got this. Mm. Um, you know, I think what I should have said is there's no way there's anyone faster than me in the world. Maybe I could have came back with a medal. <laughs> you next know? time. Man. Next <laughs> maybe, next, yeah. maybe next Olympics. Definitely. Start today. With, um, you, you're saying then about like the races as well. So I'm getting way too into this, but I'm really intrigued. Like, do you think athletes that win gold are always the fittest or do you think like they're mentally the strongest? Because I can imagine on that big stage, like, it's different to running in Europe. It's different to running in Australia. When you're on the Olympics, the world stage, do you think a lot of people would get freaked out by that? Or do you think the best runners are the ones that perform on the big stage the most? The ones that have it both in check. Yeah. Because you can't neglect the fitness either. Like I could sit there believing myself all I want and then yeah. like, like not train, get on the beers, whatever, and go run. It's like, damn, like it's actually quite hard. So but what you're saying is even if I believe in myself <laughs> and I did the marathon, I still can't. Without I mean, I'm not trying to break any hearts. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <I'm> just, <laughs> Makes sense. But, but yeah, you've got to, I think you've got to have them both in check. Like, yeah. I guess the 800 is like our final. Um, the fastest guy in that final ran 142. And he only ran it a few, like I think less than a month before the Olympics. But he didn't win a medal. Like, He's like last year, he's still the fastest on time, mm. but he didn't place at the Olympics. So yeah, it takes, it's like, can you then like, okay, you can run fast, but can you put it together when it counts, when it matters? Um, okay. Sorry. We'll keep going around, but go back to the, you know, your first heat, you're in that mindset, you know, that you can compete with the rest of the runners. Talk us through the, like how many heats is there? Two? One. Um, so heat, semis and final. Heat, semi and final. So you have your mm-hmm. heat semi-final so there's two races before the big one so heat was quite simple uh it's like you know what you got to do top three if not try to get fourth to be the fastest loser uh top three go to next to next stage and you know the heat was like i was so confident like i woke up i was just chilling like it's like someone said why are you so relaxed i'm like well what is they kind of worry about like I've ran the 800 multiple times. Like, yes, I ran it in Australia, I ran it in Europe. Like the only difference is I'm running it in Tokyo. Like, I guess that's the mindset you gotta kind of have. Like you're still running the same distance. It's like, you're not running extra or mm-hmm. anything like that. You're still running the 800 meters and you're running against people you've already raced against before as well. And that's why I helped to previously go to Europe beforehand and invest those people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was quite confident. And I, and I rocked up to the start line and Richard won that heat in like 143 maybe high and I was 144, 13 to break the Australian record. 
those were the two fastest times in Olympic history in the heats, like the fastest times. Like heats are usually one in like 145. That's really fast. But like to run 143, that was ridiculous. But I didn't feel like it was that fast because you saw me like slowing down, looking around and, and like everyone's like, go, 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 go. Like, I'm like, it's, it's not about that, right? It's, it's like, all you need to be is top three. Mm. So like we got another round the next day. And like, and then once I kind of saw that time, I was like, oh shit, like, damn, am I going to back up tomorrow? And then there was that little doubt. But then I woke up the next day and it felt like I didn't race. Like, I just felt like so fresh. And I was like, I was warming up and I was like, yep. Like, you know, you have that smile, like, yeah, it's going to be a good race. And again, went out hard, same strategy and, you know, looked around and the last bit, you know, put my finger up, won that race, another strand record. So that, I think that made the story so big after that, like two strand records in two days. And like to put that into perspective, Joseph broke the strand record in 2018. And before that, I think it was 50 years, Yeah, you know, 50 years to break the strand record. Like that's, it's something big. And then to come again and twice years in, later, yeah, twice, twice in, in two, two days. days, you know, we just trying to, I guess, we, I guess a whole, a whole fast state track club. We're just trying to build a different kind of mm. culture, inspire a different kind of confidence. Like, you know, we're not limited by, you know, by history or whatnot. Like even like the Australian records, not a history. Like if we don't really think about them. We think about like what's next. Like it's, it's awesome. We have it. It's awesome. We wanted them. We wanted the Australian records. We have them but like, like what's next, you know? So, and then it comes to the finals, like, and then you, and then it's like, I think it was too long before of the final because you get a day off and then it's the final. Yes, you have a day off. That was what I was minding. Like quickly on that, the recovery of what you do. Like what are you doing in that day off? Are you just like icing, stretching? Like what do you, you... I hate ice baths, but yeah. I was I was having ice baths in Tokyo. Like I was forcing myself to have ice bath. And they they really help. Yeah. And I always know they kind of help. I just hate the ice bath. It's too cold. Like I'm from Perth. Like we, we don't them. we don't like the cold. Oh. Like it's just too cold, but I kind of just had high spots while I was there. Um, amazing medical team, uh, physio, massages, um, and also like the importance of just kind of resting and eating is so important. Like you just gotta kind of eat, fuel, fuel, fuel. Like your body is going through a lot. Like two records in two days. Like you need to refuel, 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 repair all those muscles for the final. Uh, and then, and then I guess you had to also kind of stay focused within two days mm. um, before the final. Have you got like, are you blocking out like your phone? Have you got that on you? Cause I can imagine it'd be blowing up with like Australian sort of media and everything. Like I can yeah. remember. No, I wasn't blocking that out. I, sh I remember, I think I said something like, no, I'm not blocking out. Like embrace it. Yeah. Just embrace it. And, and I was embracing it. It was quite funny. Cause I was seeing like my family going crazy in Perth. Uh, my brother's writing stupid things in the, uh, uh, saying some silly things in the, in the news and whatnot, yeah. um, it kind of made it kind of made the time go faster, and and I kind of like just embraced it, and and kind of gave me good support, and you know, and then the final day comes, and you still gotta wait to like, I think it was like night time, so you still gotta wait that whole time to race, and like you just gotta kill time, kill time, mm. and I mean Tokyo, you couldn't do anything anyways, yeah, with COVID, so, with COVID and stuff, uh, and then you get to the final, and you're like, yep this is it. Like, this is the last race, like one more. And, and again, like I was feeling kind of, kind of fresh, but I also knew the race wasn't going to be that fast. So the heat in the semis were actually faster than, than what, the final. Is that, is that what we were talking about before? Like the tactics of the it? Tactics, were you yeah. saying like the, the leaders were going to probably just hold back? Is that how it works? Uh, well, the front runners were knocked out in the, during the rounds. Usually right. there's at least one front runner in the final, but there wasn't any front runner. So it's like, do you, you don't want to be the front runner, but you don't want to be at the back and get tripped up or in the middle and get into that as well. So it's like, what's the best plan? And I think the best plan is we race that race to plan. The only thing you would have changed is believing yourself a little more by saying that is you didn't have to kick from 300, you know, just stay relaxed, mm. back your kick. I don't know. It might've been different. You know, it might've been, we never know. That's the thing. Like you can't, you can't say it could have been different or not. You, it's just, we never know, but if I was to do anything different, it's kind of believe in your kick and not kick too early. Yeah. But on that, I think I'd race exactly the same as I race for yeah. that final race. Well, fuck, I don't know much about 800s, but it looked looked very nice. Yeah. It looked very clean. I get, the guy that won was, he's gonna always be tough to beat because his personal best over 400 
it's like 44 seconds. Mm. Like he's the fastest in the field speed wise. So, and he was sitting in a good position. So he was honestly like impossible. I was surprised with Rotich, you know, because Rotich was just looking unreal during those games. But the race, I guess, suited the other guy better. Um, the Kenyans are always tough to beat. Um, Patrick Dobek, the Polish guy, just had an outstanding race and just kind of put it together, sitting on the rail, sitting on the rail and just going when it needed to happen and getting in good positions. So, yeah, it's, but it's like you finish and you're like, you got the whole country behind you. And this is where it was hard. Like you got the whole country behind you, the whole support around you. You embrace that as much as you want, but you also, you still didn't achieve what you wanted to achieve. Mm. So you kind of go back and you're disappointed, but you don't want to look, you have to be happy. And I was like, so it helped focusing on that support rather than, rather than the results until I got on that plane back to Europe to think about the race and kind of reflect back on it and just kind of focus on the support because it kind of kept you content and kept you happy during, during those two days in, in Tokyo after the race. And then once you get to the plane, you're like, oh man, damn, I came fourth. Like, like what's the next chance to be in the Olympic final? Like three years away, like in Paris, mm. it would have been nice just to come back with a medal. But you know, the thing is, um, Rotich <laughs> gave me a bracelet, the Kenyan bracelet. And I'm like, is that rude or is that, was he just being nice? <laughs> like, oh, like, that's pretty dope. <laughs> is that it there? Yeah, that's right well, there. So, so what did he give that to you? Like, just to say, like, well done? <laughs> or you don't know? <laughs> um, no, no, we're pretty... <laughs> the 800 guys are good pretty stuff, man. pretty good, good friends. Yeah, Maybe bracelet. next time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Might not have won a medal. But no, we're like, I guess the 800 guys are pretty friendly. Yeah. Man, it was quite nice. Um, actually, gave me two. Okay. It was nice. You came back. Came oh. back with something, right? That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah. Cool. <laughs> I like that. I like that bracelet. Nice. Yeah. No, it's got, I, I didn't, so I wasn't sure where we're going with that. I thought he, did he give the, I, I'm still myth. Did he give the bracelet nicely or was he giving the bracelet? No, no, very nicely. Very okay. nicely. Very nice. You come forth, you cross the line. Um, as you said then, like it's an incredible feeling because you've done something that, you know, not many people have done. You've broken two Australian records, but at the end of the day, you go there to win gold. Yeah. And that's what you want to do. But don't you feel now that like with Rio, didn't go the way you wanted Tokyo you take that massive step it could put you in a good spot like mentally and just with the confidence knowing for every any other race now you can compete with the best yeah and also like like the support like that much support is really hard to kind of just keep focusing on like coming forth and not meddling because like you can never change that right but at least the support is always there yeah well um, we were talking just before you, you came on that was a f I think the fourth viewed event yeah. Australian history, yeah, which is which is incredible because we only went for one forty four, three point four, yeah, million Australian viewers. Yeah, that's yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, like to think that many people were like, I guess you capture everyone's interest. Like, yeah, yeah. But I think what what really got everyone watching is, of course, like, it's the Olympics have always happened, and I guess one was like fifty three years ago, like was the last Australian the final. Two was like this incredible story that was developing over the heats, the semis. Mm, mm. Three was like, you know, you, this dude's broken two records in two days. He's like, can he actually win gold in the finals? So it was awesome. And I guess, I guess my family, you know, shout out to them back home, you know, just being there, like they're like partying, like I won <laughs> every single heat, like they're just kind of dancing and all that stuff and, and like embracing it. And everyone kind of fell in love with that. And then I was sitting there like, I'm like, that's, that's the power of like, um, I guess culture, like, mm. like for me, like seeing that, I was like, yeah, that's normal. Like my family has any reason to celebrate like that, like nephew's birthday, like they're going crazy like that. Um, that's just in our culture. That's, that's how we celebrate each other. Um, it was great for us of Australia to see it and to see that's how we kind of do things. And it's awesome. Well, that's probably the impact that you have, like without even knowing and considering now asking you like how big was the impact off the track. So even in terms of like your community, like the, uh, the Sudanese community, like did you find that was something that you didn't even realize how big that would be? Like did you, did you understand the impact you were having um, in that space? It was massive. I didn't understand that at the start. Like I think we were speaking before about even like small things such as like following on, on the social media mm. and stuff like that. Like I went there with like eight to seven thousand followers and then you see like it's just raising 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 and as they're raising what you guys don't see is inbox is raising at the same time and he went from like, <laughs> like I was, yeah. I was um, in there. and it goes from like seven thousand to like 
46, whatever it was. Yeah. Um, by the final, it's like, whoa, like, that's a lot of support. Yeah. And there's all these people that don't even have social media. Like, you know, every single platform was just three, full. three plus million. Yeah. I know every, you. Yeah. Every platform was like love. Like, you go on your phone, there's a bunch of messages, you know, whether it's Messenger, WhatsApp, whatever platform, LinkedIn, like you got a bunch of messages there. Yeah, just linking uh, in for business. Yeah, <laughs> even that. And then you go on to, um, I get Facebook, there's a bunch of messages there. And then you got Instagram, there's just a bunch of messages there. And you're like, damn, like the impact that you can have within like 144 seconds is insane. Yeah. Like it's, it's just, it just helps. You got to come back to yourself just as well on as you do off the track as well which is really important what was the biggest um surprise after that like you said then you know the, the instagram blew up all the socials blew up did anything like was there anyone that reached out that you were just like fuck this is unbelievable yeah i was going um i had a press conference for the aoc and and then i kind of bribed my way through to um to the basketball uh watch basketball which is the boomers reversing reversing um the u.s and i always wanted to watch the u.s and i always wanted to watch like Patty Mills and Australians play. So I was like, that's the perfect game. Like, I was like, yeah, I'll come to the press conference. But like, anyway, we can get to the game too. And they're like, yeah, sure. And on the way to the game, one of um, the OC members said, Pete, we got, we got this strange request for you. I was like, what do you mean by strange? Like, everything's been strange for the last 48 yeah. hours, you know? Um, how strange can it be? And she's like, well, um, the Prime Minister wants to speak to you. I'm like, the Prime Minister wants to speak to you? It's like, First thought is like, you know, like, are you even allowed to say no? Like, yeah. at, that, at that stage, like, is that a request or is that like, you, you know, to do it, he yeah. had to do it. Like, and of course I wanted to speak to him. And so I was like, of course, like give him my number. And we actually didn't call that day. And, and the next day I flew over to Europe and I was, I was sleeping because of the time zone. And I think my phone was ringing and I think it was like maybe 6 a.m. And I look at it. Of course, no one has a prime minister's number. I'm like, who's calling me? Like, I just hung up. <laughs> and, and I wake up a few minutes later and there's a voicemail and it's like Scott Morrison, like leaving me a voicemail. I was like, oh, damn. Scammer. Damn, like, like, that's crazy. Like, how arrogant can you be? What do like, you say? Um, something like we are so, we are proud and like, like it was just all positive things and like the way you conducted yourself and lifted lifted the spirit oh, of beautiful of australia like it was it was really positive words man and like i called him back and i was like like i was thinking like I probably still wouldn't like have a number and just call it so i called him back and funny enough he picked up it's like his number so like biggest flex like i have his number on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> call, can we call him now <laughs> no, come on call him now. Call him i now. can't play the voicemail though play the voicemail <laughs> you want to play it right can now can you play it yeah yeah that'd be awesome <laughs> that'd be great <laughs> It's Scott Morrison calling. It's really good. Thank you for everything you've done in Tokyo. Not just your achievements on the track, but the way you've gone about it. It meant a great deal to a lot of people at a very difficult time. And uh, I loved what you had to say after the race about what's ahead. Uh, I think that's true for the whole country. So thanks for lifting us up, mate. And uh, I look forward to your safe journey back home. And uh, I, I look forward to meeting you. I, I really love to do that. Take care. All the best. That's huge. <laughs> yeah, so like, and then you just you can't. That was like, actually really good. I thought he was talking to me. <laughs> that, like felt like he was genuine. He was like a good dude. Yeah, and yeah. then you just kinda of see the impact like you make. Like if you if we go back to us like the start of the episode, like eighteen years ago, I wasn't even an Australian citizen, right? And then like eighteen years on, you've made two world champs, two Olympic games, and the Prime Minister's calling you. Like, that's unreal. Like it's a story like you kinda of wanna write, which is which is crazy, especially, and it was more impactful. Like, and that's why I guess at the, end, at the end of the race, when they said like, it's huge for the Sudanese community, of course it was massive for migrants in the Sudanese community and stuff like that. Cause it's just important. And, but I felt like it was more important for my family. Cause like between all the struggles that were sold during the Olympic games, like from, from refugee camp to this and that, mm. like you still gotta understand that I came to this country when I was 10 years old. Like you give good credit to your parents for bringing you here at such a young age. And like at a young age, you don't really know much struggle. Like they've experienced most of the struggle. So it just means so much for them to see like their son do so well and someone's do so well. Like it's like, man, we're so glad we came and found a bit of life here, right? So it's, it was like that kind of that powerful 
So that's why like a fan was kind of going crazy. And it was just, it was just bigger than, it was bigger than the gold medal. Like the gold medal, I don't know what the gold medal would have done. Like, mm. you know, oh, it would have been crazy, but like just having that is crazy. Cause now you got the prime minister and you know, another person like, um, shout out, shout out to Bill, Bill Shorten. He's, he's been on our team for like a while before the Olympics, before anything, you know, like when we first moved to Melbourne and it's always been super helpful or when we couldn't get overseas to compete and we needed to get over there, he helped with that stuff because there was, of course, there was restrictions on Australians in and out, but he's always kind of helped with that. So like there's always been great people and yeah, it's just been so many messages, you know, Nick Nat, um, you know, I'm a massive West Coast fan. So reaching out after that and just a bunch of great people reaching out after the race as well. It's crazy, bro. And, and just on, on your family, I, I cannot imagine how proud they are of you because you have done not just them proud, but the whole country proud. We're so excited to see what's next. The part I really liked about what Skomo said was in that time, you know, when you did do this and yes, it's like, it's a race, it's the Olympics, it's incredible. You've, you've done something massive, but you realize what you've been saying, how much bigger that was for everyone. Like even we're all struggling, locked inside a home and people are watching you without even knowing you and you've just changed their whole week or month by yeah. just doing that. And I think that's the impact that you probably, you do understand, but you don't because before I even knew you, yeah, you know, you put a smile on my face, which is crazy. And it's, it's crazy. Unreal. But then it goes like back to that opportunity, like back, back then, like when a, a teacher just approaches this kid and says like, I think you're a pretty good runner. Um, like it's like, it wouldn't have started yeah. then. Like giving, I guess giving everyone that opportunity to be included in, I guess not even included like in opportunity wise, because the opportunities are always there, especially like the school I went to and, and like being in Australia compared to other places in the world. It's like, it's like recognizing like those opportunities is a whole different ball game. It's like you can have an opportunity and neglect it, but once you recognize it's, it's one, it's like, no, you want to take advantage of it. And, mm. and we did that. We took advantage of that. And then along that, along the way of all of that, you know, we've always remained humble and, and remember the most important thing is which is to be a better person before a better athlete. And then like, cause athletics runs out eventually. Mm. You don't want to be this athlete. Like, you're so arrogant and so rude to everyone and then like you washed up and then now you gotta go back and humble yourself over again you know so it's important to kind of just be that good person is that your is that your message today to people listening um young people old people whoever it is like take your opportunities yeah 100 percent. you know take take opportunities and and support others really because you know i've had a lot of support along the way mm. you know you don't know how many i guess lives you can kind of change cliche as that sounds definitely it's a butterfly effect closing doors it's yeah if you didn't um take the opportunity yes you could be playing nba right now but <laughs> yeah you could be playing for the perth wildcats <laughs> they, they do some good things but instead you're running the olympics what's next for you bro um obviously you're not slowing down like you're 27 mm -hmm. scary man mm. you've got a lot of life ahead like in in the athletic world what's like the goals with it all what's your plans like with with in the athletics in the track and field space and then i suppose it would be cool to know as well as something i'm always interested in is what's goals away from the track i guess this year although the olympics last year is pretty big you got the world championships in july and then you've got the commonwealth games in august so it's it's a massive year like world championships wise and then the commonwealth but you also have still you know i'm racing on saturday in adelaide and then you still have to get through that nationals year in april so we've got a pretty big calendar on us. And of course, another one is, is with, with the success of the Olympics and all that stuff, there's all these new opportunities, you know, um, commercially and stuff like that, which I have amazing team behind me. You know, mm. I've got my agent, James Dumbleton, and then I've got a new commercial as well. Mm. Management Fordham, which manage all that stuff. So yeah. we're pretty- Are you, we're Who's those Bonos at the moment? Who have we got? Um, yeah, there's actually a few I can't actually say. Oh, right okay. But um, I like that. Yeah, I like that. But you know, yeah. yeah, what's good is um, the opportunity to be able to do, because I already did so much speaking before, to be able to speak at a bigger platform and mm. to more people and reach more people. Like I think I was doing Zoom calls and that's the beauty of, of technology, right? Um, while I was still overseas, I was still able to be connected to so many people around the yeah, world. Yeah, so you, you can do, talk, you do talks and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah. Like I did heaps online and it's great to do something in person. Though, yeah, so, yeah um, it's good to be here today. You've got a great story. Anyone yeah. out there who wants to 
get involved. So yeah, LinkedIn, baby. Yeah, LinkedIn. Yeah, LinkedIn. We love connect, it. Connect. Just on like when you're talking about commercially and stuff, but how hard is it to actually make a living through athletics if you're not like where you are in being that top three in the country? It's actually really hard. Um, like super hard, I think. Yeah. Especially if you if you're out here in Australia because well one, like sponsorship is really hard. It's hard to get. Mm. Um so you you're with Adidas? Yeah, I'm with Adidas. Yeah. Uh so like Joseph and I were quite lucky and we have a good agent um to be able to get Adidas a few years ago. But to also do that, we actually performed pretty well and you gotta perform on the world stage. Yeah. Like in the form on the world stage, you gotta you gotta cop the cost of going overseas and and racing there, and not even that. Like you can even cop the fees and go there, but still not be able to go into races. Because again, like the top races are diamond league races, and you gotta be top in the world to be racing those. So it's like it, when you say agent too, like is that do you qualify these races on time, or is it more like your agent actually getting you into the races? So well, one you gotta be fast enough to do it. To do it, yeah. Too, you got to have a good agent good when relationship. you say good agent so where does the agent come in so if you're getting the time though shouldn't you just be in the race or is it does it not work no nah, like because that? there's heaps of people getting those times too ah. like so it's like, like boxing yeah there's like, heaps of people getting those yeah like there's a how many people in the world around like 144 like although i came fourth in the the olympics last year there's still there's more than four people faster than me time wise so technically they should be ahead of you yeah right. in in those races so yeah. that's where it's really difficult and and again like it's like athletics is really hard to watch it anywhere so like if i said i'm racing adelaide on saturday and you say like where can i watch i'd be like i don't know man like i guess commercially wise like if you're a sponsor like it's hard to sponsor hard, yeah it's very hard to sponsor something someone that's like like not like footy like you it's like weekly they're always there you're watching and mm. their presence out there so lastly big news with com games coming up how are you tracking for that? Are you going to be in your B game? You're going, going to try and win. Like I'm saying that seriously. Is it <laughs> is it is it something for you that is actually on the radar? Like, do you want to win the Com Games, or is there something that's you know more important and and to get to where you want to be after that? Like, I think Worlds is more important for me. But like again, if we're speaking commercially, um, Com Games is huge for Australia. Yeah, and Australian athletes. Yeah. Exactly. So Com Games still has to be like a big focus at the same time. And it's a good thing is like two weeks after um, World Champs. So you still you're still in shape. Yeah, you're still building. He's still building and yeah. still in that shape. Uh, but yeah, the goal is always to try to win at all costs. Uh, the thing is though, like you have, you still have Kenya part of the Commonwealth. Oh, so you yeah. still have one and two. Yeah. They're going to be there racing. But you don't, you don't have the Polish. But it's still super competitive. Cool. So it's like it's pretty much is like a warm up for worlds anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. it's huge. So it'll be just as tough to compete there. Like I think twenty eighteen when Joseph, Brad Mathis, both my training partners made the final. Uh, and Luke Matthews actually, you know, mm. yep, um, yep. finished finished the Commonwealth Games. Like it was big because like he was versing Africa usually dominates, especially Kenya, dominates that distance running. You're missing of course you're missing Europe, which helps. So the Polish guy's not there. But you still have to be in your A game. Athletics, track and field going super, super well off the track. Um, you got your podcast as well. Yeah. Dominating in my spikes. Yeah. Um, you're going to pick that back up again soon. Where can we find it? Um, where can we listen? And give us a couple of um, guests that you've had on the show and, and what you sort of talk about. I know I've listened to a couple of episodes today. Yeah. So originally the plan was to have 10 episodes. I think I got to nine and start again once the athletic season starts. Because you kind of realize by the time you get back home, especially from the success of the Olympics, there's going to be so much on. You've got family mm. commitments and all that stuff. And you don't want to fit all these things well while you're still trying to kind of embrace everything and reflect on everything. So I guess some of the big guests or some some of the really good conversation I had, it's called In My Spikes. And it's My Spikes because I guess it's like my journey. It's like My Spikes got me to meeting, I guess, you, mm. for instance, um, like Harry Garside. Great guy, met him in Tokyo. If it wasn't for the spikes, I wouldn't have met him. So, you know, you have conversations. Uh, Duop was another one. Um, but also that first season was literally just supposed to be like people, early beginning journey of my spikes. So you had, you know, you see that you had my coach in there. Um, you had uh, my coach 
for the for the gym in there um and then you had some teammates in there as well so yeah so it's be pretty interesting the unique thing is you know we travel the world so much so you gain all this different perspective yeah you gotta take you gotta take it with you man so when you when yeah. you go to these events you can grab just anyone just yeah, grab anyone, anyone. There, yeah so you get like all these different perspectives because you can learn so much through books and through media or whatever but like it's it's so powerful just sitting down and talking to people like oh, i've learned a lot today yeah from like where, where they're from and like just asking them simple questions like where are you from you know ballarat <laughs> yeah <laughs> Ballarat. Yeah, it's a good spot. <laughs> um, no, that's awesome, man. In all seriousness, check that out. In my spikes, um, Spotify, iTunes, everything. We have a link in the bio as well, so everyone can check it out. But um, Pete, thanks so much, bro. It's been Thank an you. honor to have you in the studio. Thank you for everything. You've done us extremely proud, but I know you're going to do some some cool things um, on the track, but I think you're going to do some even cooler things off it. So thank you so much for your time. Honor to meet you. Um, and can you get some tickets for the Com Games for the sort us out? Is that cool? Yeah, I got you, boys. <laughs> how, 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 many, how many you guys need? Uh, how many? How many can you get? Um, one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, just. <laughs> I can't get you guys at the after parties. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. that'd be good. That'd be um, good. Awesome, man. Thanks so much. No, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure.